hello, and you are watching the Live Today Show right here on Can TV Channel 21. I'm Dr. Cherie, your host for the show and the founder of the Live Today Foundation, where our mission is to provide inspiration, joy, and free compression garments to under-resourced cancer patients and survivors living with lymphedema. Our followers also know that we provide education and resources on a variety of topics designed to help you live today and every day. And we have a very interesting topic today and a very special guest. But before I introduce this beautiful lady, I want to share with you just some information so that you don't know how to get in touch with us. First of all, if you're wanting to know more about the Live Today Foundation, you want to look at resources, or you know of someone who is in need of compression garments, have them go out to our website. Click on the tab that says Request for Free Garment Application and start the simple process to get them the garments that they need. So you can go out to www.live-today.org. You can also shoot us an email at info at live-today.org. Tell us what you thought about the program today. Give us some new program ideas, or just reach out to us and tell us that we're doing a great job. That's always helpful. You can also give us a call at 754-220-0234. And if you are out on social media, feel free to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at livetoday.org. That's livetoday, D-O-T-O-R-G. And you can find the recordings of all of our past shows, plus some additional resource videos. If you go out and look us up and subscribe to us on YouTube at the Live Today Foundation. So, now, I am super duper excited to introduce to you this special guest. Now, Lauren Walrath is Vice President of Public Affairs for Kiowa Kieran, North America. Now, she joined the organization in September of 2019, and she's a member of the North American Executive Committee. As head of the department, Lauren directs a range of programs to educate and engage key audiences, including corporate and brand public relations, social media, internal communications, and patient ambassador and patient advocacy engagements across all disease areas. So this includes central nervous system, oncology, and rare disease. Additionally, she sponsors North American work teams in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and patient centricity. Lauren has 20 plus years of experience, including 15 in the pharmaceutical industry alone. Lauren earned her MBA from Columbia University Graduate School of Business and a Bachelor of Science in Advertising and Public Relations from Penn State University's Schreier Honors College. Yeah, you heard me, Honors College. This is a heavy hitter, guys. She is also a member of the Healthcare Business Women's Association. Lauren, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, I'm so pleased to be here today. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I know your schedule is jam packed, but you have a lot that you can fill us in on. Right now, we're in a place and space of dealing with not only with the rise in traditional cancers that we hear about, um, but I think it's important for individuals to understand that there are some rare diseases that uniquely attack certain ethnic racial backgrounds. And those need and require attention and knowledge because without that knowledge, we can't act, correct? And I love the fact that you are working in the place and space of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Tying that in with various disease processes is powerful. So I had to have you as a guest on the show. So we have a lot to cover. We do. Um, and that's quite the introduction. So uh, hopefully I live up to helping people understand what's happening in these different spaces and what make a difference. So thank you. Sure. I have no doubt. So let's jump right in. Can you give us a brief history of Kiowa Kieran? Sure. Uh, Kiowa Kieran is a, a top 50 global pharmaceutical company. Uh, we are headquartered in Tokyo in Japan. Uh, and we have a long history there. Actually, the company came together uh, from a merger of two companies back in 2008. And so the combined history of those companies goes back more than 70 years. 
But really every day around the world, and we work in four different regions, North America is one and we are the fastest growing one, but we also have business in the EMEA region. So Europe and Middle East and Africa, in Japan, as we talked about, and also in Asia Pacific. And every day our colleagues all around the, the globe are really working to make a profound impact for patients through our work, through our people, really the great people that we have in our business, and through our collaborations with different academic institutions, different uh, hospitals and providers around the world, as well as the patient communities. Uh, and really at the end of the day, what we what ties us all together at Kiwa Karen is not just our mission to really have that profound impact for patients, but we, we really have four global values that kind of guide us in our work. Uh, we are committed to integrity, to innovation, to teamwork and WA, which is this Japanese idea of really working kind of harmoniously as a team and, and really finding the best from everyone's contributions. And then through all of those three values, we really aspire, as I said, to have a commitment to life, a strong commitment to life and to making a difference for patients. So uh, that's a little bit about the company. <laughs> wow, wow. So so Kira Kieran, I know, has a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Can you describe the company's work and, and also how it in, informs efforts to engage physicians and patients? Sure. So when I first joined the company in 2019, this was a discussion that we were having uh, with our leadership team and with HR. What was our commitment and what could we express to uh, our own employees and our own staff, as well as to the communities that we really worked with? And of course, as you know, the events of the next year really transpired and the events of 2020 began to you know, unfold, we really took it upon ourselves, especially here in North America, to make that commitment as strong as it possibly could be and as clear as it possibly could be um, to our employees. Because we said, you know, it wasn't enough just to say that diversity was important to us. We had to show it. And we really had to you know, make clear goals about what improvements would really look like. So uh, at the beginning, actually, of 2021, we, we put out a call to our own employees and we said, you know, we wanted everyone who had a passion for diversity, equity and inclusion to get involved with us and to really help in sort of defining the work we needed to do um, and help us make the plans for how we could advance DNI in all facets of our business. And so we have a fantastic team now that really does try to work together, as I said, as a strong team, teamwork. Um, to, to really kind of uh, achieve a few big goals, and, and, and some of these are pretty big and aspirational. Uh, we want to try and make sure that our business really reflects the society that we're part of. Um, so we want, you know, a diverse workforce where people really uh, are able to, to bring their full selves to work every day and to contribute really their own experiences to doing our work better. Um, so we try to do that. We try to make sure that we work with diverse suppliers. We try to make sure that we have training programs that help people with cross-cultural communications, that we have the right talent acquisition and mentoring strategies to help our people grow and achieve their own career goals. And then very, very importantly, as you said, we want to make sure that our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion really does inform our work for patients. Um, so we try and make sure now that it is a part of our discussions when we're doing clinical trials. How will we get a diverse patient population enrolled into our clinical trials? How can we work with maybe more diverse uh, investigators who can help us in terms of making sure that we get you know, the right patient population enrolled? And we work with our advocacy partners, so patient advocacy groups and people who are really kind of the, the direct line, I would say patients have to, you know, answering their questions, finding out more information, you know, from an independent and objective source. We work with those patient advocacy groups to understand, too, what are some of the special populations that we need to reach and how can we do that better? Um, and where are we facing challenges in doing that? Because, um, you know, it's not always easy through some of, uh, to rely on some of the same old panels or old practices that pharma has used. Um, we know for a fact that that, you know, hasn't worked very well in terms of reaching some some minority populations. So um, so we are trying to work with our advocacy groups and, and learn from them as well and, and encourage them to learn from the patients that they serve. Wow. OK, so what are you guys 
do you have a plan? I know that you initially started off by asking current employees, okay, those of you that have a passion for D, D and I, okay, what can we do? And how can we improve our processes, not only within the organization, but with the patients that we serve and with the physicians that we work with? Have you guys taken on a different stance, say, when it comes to talent acquisition? Um, have you considered or are you doing any type of mentoring with individuals so that they can gain a better understanding of, all right, I understand what diversity, equity, inclusion is, but how does that impact me on a personal level and how does that impact me at work and how does what I do at work impact the population in general? Yeah, well, I think I think what's so interesting about the way that we've approached this is we've said, you know, it's not about one aspect of diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Um, it really is something that touches all parts of the business and all people in the business and the people that we are, are trying to serve, the communities of patients that are out there. Um, so you asked about a couple of things in particular. We, we have prioritized talent acquisition as one of the areas we want to try and um, accelerate work on. It was actually interesting when we when we spoke to this group of 40 employees about our priorities and about our goals. Um, we we got, you know, the range of goals kind of pretty well defined. And then we had to go back to them and say too, well, tell us a little bit more about how we can pace ourselves through this change process or or through this process of of evolving the organization and its work. What are we doing well that we need to continue? What are we not doing maybe as well as we could that is an urgent, urgent priority that needs immediate focus today? <laughs> um, and then what else is a big priority for the business, but we know it's going to take more time to see the change and to realize the change um, that we need in our business. So we actually had to break down our goals into those three different buckets, You know, what to continue and to just keep making progress on, what needed immediate attention, and what could we take a little bit more time to build our plans around? Um, so as you said, talent acquisition really fell into this bucket of urgency. Um, we have a culture we believed that welcomed people from all backgrounds um, and you know, all age groups, all ethnicities, but we didn't necessarily have as much representation in the workforce as we felt we needed. Um, and again, that representation is incredibly important because uh, we need to understand from our own people how to communicate better with different patients, with different physicians that are out there. And having those perspectives inside the company really does help inform our conversations and informs our business decisions. It even informs, you know, our funding priorities. So um, it's really important that we do attract a diverse talent pool into the organization. And that became one of the, the kind of initiatives that we prioritize as needing immediate attention. Um, so we made great strides in the first year. We um, had uh, the opportunity, I guess I would say, as a growing organization to, first of all, continue hiring into new and different parts of our business and growing capabilities. Um, last year, we added 160 roles into the North American business, um, and that's out of a total of about 550, so it's a substantial percentage of our business. And of course, through that hiring, that gives us a great opportunity to find new talent, to find diverse talent, um, and to bring people in at all different levels in the organization. Um, so that is something that we have prioritized, making sure that we have diverse talent pools. We also, over the past two years, have hired and um, actually added, I would say, some new members of our executive committee here in North America. And through those changes as well, we've really made incredible strides. We have an executive leadership team that is half women, um, which is, I think, pretty remarkable yes. and something to Wonderful. be proud of. <laughs> um, and in addition to being half women, we really do have, again, kind of an international perspective represented um, people from different backgrounds, different educational backgrounds. And, and it really is a wonderful team to be part of. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. And it sounded like I need to go to the website and look at open job positions. <laughs> 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 this sounds like here with Kieran sounds like a fantastic place to work because you're thinking through the process and it sounds like you're getting it right. And with that, I know that and, and as you have mentioned time and time again, that the, the advocacy team at Kiowa Kieran has identified health disparities. 
as an issue of great importance. So can you tell us a little more about how that came about and what exactly are you doing to address it? Sure. So I should mention that as the head of public affairs, I lead a team that um, is responsible for internal communications, external communications uh, about our company and about our medicines, um, as well as these patient advocacy programs um, and the work that we do to build relationships and to listen really to the patient communities to understand what issues they may be facing that we can be helpful in bringing improvements to. Um, so the interesting work that we got involved in, and this really goes back to my early days here at Kiowa Kieran, uh, we were entering, we were sort of in the beginning phase of entering into a rare hematolo hematologic cancers. Um, and I know that's close to your heart. Um, and we began to really, you know, have more conversations with the advocacy groups and with some of the KOLs, the key opinion leaders, uh, who are sort of leading publishers of medical papers and data, you know, out to the medical community. And we began to talk to them more and more to understand what were some of the, you know, underlying issues of concern to patients with these rare hematologic cancers, including cutaneous T cell lymphomas. And what we began to understand is that while many medical advances had occurred and new medicines were available, there was, you know, a, a pretty stark disparity really between the outcomes that Caucasian or white patients were having um, over time and some of the outcomes or some of the, the diagnosis rates even um, and diagnosis patterns for African-American or black patients here in the US. And so we began to talk more and more about that and, and really have more of those conversations to understand the data better. And really what we understand is that African-American patients are often, you know, in particular with cutaneous T-cell lymphoma diagnosed with later stage disease and they suffer poorer outcomes partly because of that, because, you know, the disease is being found late and likely has metastasized. And so we really began to think, you know, that maybe we could do it a little bit more and we can certainly try and find ways of working with different groups and different organizations to address the issues of underdiagnosis and gaps in care that could be affecting Black patients in particular. Um, and so we began our efforts, uh, this actually dates back now a, a few years, back in 2020. And I should say, um, you know, our efforts date back even further than that with our clinical trials and our clinical programs to try and make sure that again, we really got patients involved in the clinical trials, uh, all, all kinds of patients, you know, from different backgrounds, from different geographies, uh, and again, black patients in particular, knowing that some of these uh, outcomes really uh, were of great concern to that patient population. Um, but we began uh, our advocacy efforts in about 2020 um, to try and bring more attention to uh, these rare cancers and to the disparities facing Black patients. Um, and we've tried to activate, you know, more awareness. Uh, we've tried to build campaigns that are shared not, not only through our, our own channels, but by, again, some of the advocacy groups, some of the advocacy partners, and even sometimes um, outreach programs that are happening through hospitals and cancer centers to try and reach out to these communities as well. So we've really tried um, through our work, through some dispersion of, of grants, um, through some events that we've helped to organize and, and, uh, and do over the past couple of years. And I can share a little bit more about that, but we've tried to build more awareness and continued focus on these disparities and the fact that they matter, but that things can be done about them. We can get patients um, into places where they can get the best care and best treatment possible. And hopefully if we do that, if we raise awareness, if we encourage more education, uh, about this issue, then hopefully patients will benefit. <laughs> I agree. You know, the the reality is, and there, I work with a number of organizations, right? And a lot of them are cancer organizations, especially with the nonprofits. And one of the things that we've discovered in medicine um, from the scientific clinical trial side to the living out the survivorship and or experience side, cancer in black individuals is just different. Um, and it's almost, you know, getting the 
in general, black cancer, because it, typically if you can come up with a cancer, it's going to behave differently within the black community for a number of reasons. We cannot discount the social determinants of health, cannot discount that, right? Um, we know that there is health disparities. We know that there is this push and move towards health equity, but we also know that there is a level of dealing with mistrust and a level of not having the right education and not having the access and not necessarily having the insurance or the finances. So there is so much that pours into this Black cancer category, if you will, um, that impacts us in a way that it is impossible to move the needle without doing work like what Kira Kieran is doing. It's impossible to move the needle. And that's why I was so moved to have you on the show because more and more organizations and individuals need to see so that we can diminish the level of mistrust, that we can now look forward to hope and not think that just because we get a cancer diagnosis that it is our death sentence. So instead of searching out and getting the help and and, and, and uh, getting the resources that we need to live out a great life, not looking at it as, oh my God, I don't even want to know because once I know, I know I will die. So we have to continue to do this work because if we continue to push, just say education and awareness but don't work towards providing access or getting patients into clinical trials so that we know how well they respond to these drugs, then if we educate, but the disease process still takes the same course, then we won't move the needle because people will say, okay, now I know. And now I know that when it is diagnosed in me, it's going to be later stages. I'm going to be more likely to die. You know, I may not have the access. I may not have the, the right advocacy programs in my area. Um, you are doing and Kira Kieran are doing what is absolutely needed in order to move the needle on individuals being able to live today and every day. I appreciate you saying that. And I think really everything you mentioned is true. You know, these, these issues go back a long time in our society, right? And unfortunately there are some, some maybe not positive parts of our history in the healthcare system that really weren't serving black patients or African-American patients you know, as well as they, as it could. Um, and so, as you said, you know, there is, you know, um, a lot that has fed into the inequities that exist today. Um, and we really think, you said, we have to continue to, you know, bring awareness and educate, but we have to continue our focus on this so that things will improve. And I think that that's, um, you know, that's really a principle we're trying to live by or work by here at Kiwa Kieran, that it takes real commitment. And that commitment means um, year after year, continued focus and continued work on this issue to try and bring about the positive changes we need. And so, again, I, I mentioned, you know, as part of that story about our work in these rare cancers, um, it does go back a few years and it will continue on into the future because it's not something where we feel like one campaign, for example, in Black History Month is, is all that's required or one great round table um, like the one we had last year about Black Family Cancer Awareness Week. Uh, we had an amazing group of people who came together who really talked about these issues. We had a great response from the community about that, but it was one event and it deserves continued focus and continued effort over time. And the other thing that we've really tried to do here is bring more people into our work on this issue. Damn. So we recognize that we're an organization who can do some, some good work um, but to make a difference on inequities, and again, inequities that have, you know, uh, been brought about over decades in our society, um, we really need to get more people involved. And we need researchers, we need advocacy groups, we need community organizations and community healthcare workers, and maybe even pharmacies, um, but we need more people at the table creating um, 
access to the right healthcare expertise um, and, you know, really helping patients, you know, find their way into um, the right channels for healthcare and treatment in our society. Um, I, I hope we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what's, what's of great concern to us in these rare cancers and with the Black community is that, again, the underdiagnosis challenges are quite significant and they, they um, because they're rare, it, it, it's a compounding effect of a number of different issues. <laughs> Correct. Correct. And that makes it even more difficult, which is why I'm saying I'm so proud of what you're doing, because you're tackling not only um, dealing with trying to move the needle in DE and I, but but you're trying to move the needle with certain rare cancers that you're dealing with a small number. But if that small number has a 100 percent mortality rate because they're diagnosed too late and the resources are not there, then it needs to be addressed. And I'm, I can't tell you what that, that, what that does to me. It just warms my heart. With everything that Care Where Karen is doing, what's the vision for 2023? Yeah, so um, we have a, a lot of momentum, I would say, in the organization, and we want to continue that. Um, we think um, through our work uh, over the past couple of years, we've gotten more good talent into the organization, and that talent is coming with their ideas and their passion for what we can do better and do differently. Um, so we just had a, a nice meeting of our DE and I work group uh, last week, in fact, and we have um, what are called employee resource groups now um, set up to kind of uh, advance our work. I would say, you know, around um, um, special interest issues, I, I guess, um, you know, so we have a group that's focusing on multicultural, um, multicultural employees, their concerns and multicultural sort of communication issues and how we can improve communication across cultures. Uh, we have a group that's looking at sort of the LGBTQ and, um, you know, employee interests and, and maybe where those intersect with other aspects of our work in healthcare. Um, and then we have another group that's focused uh, on women and gender issues um, and, you know, making sure that we do the right thing for women inside the business and outside the business. Um, so we have a, a lot of momentum and we're growing our efforts in those areas, but in particular from the advocacy standpoint and the patient standpoint, um, we are uh, now thinking that because we've had, I, I think, a tremendous response to our efforts about addressing health inequities, um, in these rare cancers and in cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, not only how can we continue that work, but can we expand that to some of the other disease areas that we're working in? So whether it's rare disease or whether it's um, our neurological per, uh, you know, portfolio and some of the work we do with um, Parkinson's disease advocacy organizations, we're trying to take the lessons that we've learned and some of the successes that we've had in the cutaneous T-cell lymphoma and not lose sight of that but try and build those best practices into some of the other disease areas that we're working on. <laughs> that is fantastic. Now, I have to ask you, what can the Live Today Foundation do to help Kier with Kieran in the advancement of his mission towards diversity, equity, and inclusion? Sure. Well, I will say... Um, you know, we do try throughout the year to put out good information um, on Black patients, Black patient uh, issues, you know, and again, you know, focusing on, on, you know, some of the diseases that may disproportionately impact these patients, what they can do to get uh, or maybe facilitate a better diagnosis where they can find expert care, things of that nature, and where they can uh, turn to advocates and other patients uh, for good communication. Um, so in those months, and what I would love to see, you know, this community do, share that information. Again, one of the things that um, we believe is, you know, we're all working uh, and living really in a society where um, there's so much content and communication everywhere. So it makes it a little bit hard to make sure that your content is reaching the people who need it most. Um, and so what we ask for is if you have an audience here who is concerned about this, who has good um, relationships and good access, you know, to, to Black patients out there who may need information on rare cancers, cancer care, or cutaneous T-cell lymphomas, share it. 
you know, somebody out there probably is in need of this information. And if we can get it to them, then we need your help to do that. Um, and people listen to other people. Um, you know, hopefully they'll, they'll, they'll come to trust us um, and trust our information. But first and foremost, we know they listen to other people. Um, so it's important that people share this um, and, and feel like the information that we're putting out there is done with the best intent. And, and hopefully it is. Well, you can definitely count on the Live Today Foundation to be an advocate for Kira Kieran 100%. And guys, listen, we have had a fantastic time today, but I know some of you may still be wondering, okay, what, how can I get more information on the Live Today Foundation? Remember, you can go out to our website at www.live-today.org. We have tons of information out there, tons of resources. And don't forget, if you know someone in need of free compression garments, if they're under-resourced, cancer patients or survivors living with lymphedema, we are here to help you. Shoot us an email at info at live-today.org. Feel free to give us a call at 754-220-0234. You never know, you may catch me on the phones that day. And if you are on social media, please feel free to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at livetoday.org. That's livetoday, D-O-T-O-R-G. And you can find all of our videos and extra video resources on our YouTube channel. Just search the Live Today Foundation. Laura, you have been an absolutely phenomenal guest and I will allow you to leave us with any parting words. Sure. Um, I think advocacy is something that starts with people um, and speaking up and making sure that if uh, you, you need uh, care, you know, that um, your voice is heard and, um, you know, encouraged by people around you to continue speaking up and finding the best care. So I just want to, um, you know, let people out there know there are great new medicines available for a range of different cancers. And, you know, there are wonderful doctors and advocacy organizations willing to help patients find the best and expert care that they can. We work with the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation in particular. Um, and again, they're available to help these patients, you know, find the best care for them. Um, so you have our support, you have the support of the community and, um, and we're working for you every day. So, so, you know, keep looking for the care that you need. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. You've watched another episode of the Live Today Show. I am Dr. Cherie, your host and the founder of the Live Today Foundation. Guys, remember, be present, take charge of your life, and live today and every day. Thank you, Laura.